Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. This is the first community meeting for the uh, Road Standards Project. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, so my name is Nate Ritchie. I'm a landscape architect. I'm uh, pretty much just helping facilitate tonight's meeting. Uh, so I am here uh, with the County of San Mateo and also BKF engineers. Um, they are the civil engineers uh, putting together the, the, the technical uh, technical drawings for this project. So from the county tonight, we have Christoph Lissage. He's the Deputy Director of Public Works. We've also got Ann Stillman. She's Director of Public Works. We've got Wincy Ng, um, Senior Civil Engineer. John Shabowski, he is the Associate Engineer. And then also Kwong Tran, and he is a Civil Engineer from BKF Engineers. You can go to the next slide. So before we start tonight, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, we want to have a safe environment for everyone. Um, your uh, microphone will be muted and, and you won't have a uh, chance to talk until we get to the question and answer period, which will be towards the end of the meeting. And so at that time, we just want to make sure everyone is respectful um, to each other. Um, we will start with a presentation. Um, it's going to have question and answer at the end. If you think of a question or a comment while we're presenting, there are uh, slide numbers at the top right corner. And so if you want to, if it's about a specific slide, you could note down that number and that would help us go back to that slide once we get to the question and answer period. Um, when we get to question and answer, you'll use, there's a raise hand feature. There's an icon um, in the bottom of the screen that allows you to raise your hand. Uh, when that happens, we will go ahead and unmute you and you can answer, you can ask your question. If you're joining tonight by phone instead of uh, by the computer, you can use star nine to raise your hand. Um, and then when you hear your name called during the question and answer period, we'll unmute you and you can um, talk at that time. There's also a question and answer feature. Um, so you can also type in your question if you wanna do that instead of um, giving your question verbally. Uh, so I, as just as a note, we're gonna record the meeting tonight and it's going to be posted on the uh, project website, which is on the county's website, and that information we'll give to you towards the end of the meeting at the last slide, so you can see where that's located. So that's all I have right now. I just want to um, pass the, uh, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Christoph, and he's going to get into the different specifics of the project. Great. Thank you, Nate. So good evening, everyone. My name is Christoph Lisai, and as Nate said, I'm the Deputy Director of Public Works, overseeing the Engineering and Resource Protection Division. My team is leading the effort for this. Uh, so this slide shows the agenda for tonight. Uh, we have a lot of information to go over, so without further ado, let me get into it. The unincorporated area of Menlo Oaks in San Mateo County has road standards that were adopted back in 1998. Back then, the department went through a similar process as today, and through that process, 80% of people who responded did not want improvements, and that represented 56% of the property owners that lived in the area at that time. Therefore, the existing road widths were maintained, and future improvements were limited to maintenance. It's been about 25 years since that process, and through funding from Supervisor Slocum's office, and then Supervisor Horsley's office, and as requested by the Menlo Oaks Districts Association, we're reaching out to the community to determine if road standards should be updated. So in terms of goals of the project, we want to examine the existing road conditions and drainage issues. As part of that, we'll evaluate the potential impacts to existing features like trees, mailboxes, fence, fences, and landscaping if the road standards are revised. And then we've also prepared several different road standards for review today, and our goal is to obtain input from the community and see if they should be adopted. So this shows the project timeline for the effort. As you can see, we're at the first community meeting. Prior to this meeting, the department has been working to gather existing data of the roadways, conditions, and potential impacts through field visits and a topographical survey. You've probably seen the survey crew in your neighborhood a few months ago. So we need this information to better understand the current widths of the roadway, how they relate to the county's right-of-way, and to identify trees, landscaping, and other potential impacts. After tonight's meeting, we are going to distribute a survey for your input and comments. The survey will be open for four weeks from today, and based on the input received from the community, we'll integrate the comments into revised standards and then host a second community meeting in early 2024. After the second meeting, um, based on the second set of input, we'll work to finalize our road standards, prepare a report, 
and then present it to our Board of Supervisors for adoption. And then again, the, the board meeting will be your third opportunity to provide public comments, and those are held at the County Center in Redwood City. Again, there's been significant work that has gotten us to today, with the main part being the topographical survey. What we learned from the survey is that the road right of way in the area ranges from about 40 feet to 70 feet. Now, the road right of way is the area where the department has the right to construct roadway improvements. Another thing we found out is that several of the existing roads are not always centered in the road right of way, meaning they're shifted to one side or the other. We plan to keep the existing footprint and center line of the roadway as much as possible and do not intend to shift the roadway back to the center line of the right of way through this process. An interesting part of the data gathering is the roads in this area are generally about 18 feet wide on average, but there are some that are as narrow as 13 and a half feet in certain locations. As far as drainage in the area, we found that the area is generally flat, but it does flow from the south to north, so meaning going from Middlefield Road towards Bay. The side streets, they'll flow either east or west and then connect to a roadway that'll take it the water towards Bay Road. We also found that existing landscaping, trees, fence, and other improvements are located within the county's right-of-way, which we consider an encroachment, and that some of these encroachments will be affected by the new roadway standards. So I'll go into the detail of encroachments later in this presentation. This slide shows the area of unincorporated Menlo Oaks, which is surrounded by the town of Atherton and the city of Menlo Park. The area is generally bound by Arlington Way to the south, Bay Road to the north, Ringwood to the east, and then the back of the properties that um, front Berkeley Avenue to the west, or sorry, to the east. A couple of key items from this slide. There is a small court off of Menlo Oaks Avenue that is not a county maintained road. And so that is not gonna be included in this effort. However, the property owners that live on the corners and that have property fronting Menlo Oaks will be allowed to vote for the Menlo Oaks standard. Another key thing to note is that not all the roads have the same characteristics. So there's certain roads like Ringwood, Coleman, Arlington and Frederick Court that'll have different road standards than the rest of the area due to their width, purpose, and existing improvements. So now let's talk about the Ringwood and Coleman Ave for a minute. As many of you are aware, there is a separate effort currently being managed by a team from our Office of Sustainability at the county, and they've been working to develop a multimodal approach and alternatives for Ringwood Ave and Coleman Ave. I want to make clear that this effort and then the Ringwood Coleman study effort are different and independent of each other. Based on the contents of the effort of that effort, we've decided to remove Ringwood and Coleman from this process. Ultimately, what alternatives is selected by the community for the Ringwood and Coleman study will be the roadway standard adopted for those two streets, which will then integrate into the adopted standards for the overall area. I would like to note that the department funds will be limited to the improvements for the roadway. Other improvements in the report, such as multi-use path, sidewalks, bulb outs, or medians that come out of the Ringwood and Coleman study will need to be funded through grants or other funding sources. Now, as far as the existing road standard, this was adopted in 1998 and can be seen here. The existing road standard maintains the current width of the existing roads and future improvements will be consist solely of maintaining the existing road. Now, maintaining the existing roadway is vague, and so we will be taking this opportunity to explicitly define what the department considers as maintenance activities. Now, let's discuss the options that we present for your consideration and input. So as part of the, any new standards development, we need a baseline for comparison, and then that's going to be the current standard or the maintain as is option. Now, as far as maintain as is, what that means is that no new standards will be adopted. As I said, we are going to take an opportunity to expand on the definition of maintain as is and clearly state what is considered maintenance work. So maintenance work will include pothole or pavement repairs, crack sealing, and seals of the existing roadway. I'll explain these in detail shortly. Uh, I do want to note that maintenance does not include any kind of resurfacing project or drainage improvements. Because Menlo Oaks is so unique in the width and the use of the roadways, we needed to break down the roads into different buckets. The first area that we studied, we're calling the general area of Menlo Oaks, and this is where the majority of the roadways fall into. We've developed six options for your consideration, and they include 16, 18 or 20 feet of pavement, 
and then either a two foot wide or a three foot wide valley gutter on each side of the road. The minimum standard that we are allowed to construct, should you want a new standard, is going to be the 16 feet of roadway with two feet wide valley gutters on each side. So that's a total footprint of 20 feet. The department has been in communication with local fire and emergency response, and the minimum roadway width that is being required by fire and EMS is 16 feet of pavement with the two feet of valley gutters on each side. As I mentioned earlier, there are a few roads that do not fit into our general area for various reasons. So this includes Arlington Way, but this is only the area between Ringwood Ave and the 90 degree turn, where we'll be presenting a 20 foot road standard with either a two or three foot valley gutter. And the valley gutter will be installed on the north side only. Uh, as some of you may be aware, the south side of the street already has a curb and bitter built in, curb and gutter, and will be used to build off of. Frederick Court is another unique road where the developer built a roadway that includes 22 feet wide pavement and then two foot rolled curb and gutters on either side. We believe there's not much that can be done here to improve the standard and are proposing to maintain the roadway as is. As I mentioned earlier, Ringwood and Coleman have been removed from the effort and the standard will be developed through the Office of Sustainability Study to be integrated into these standards at a later date. Now, as far as what maintain as is entails, again, based on our expanded definition, the work will keep the existing width of the pavement. Through a combination of our roads crew and contractors, the county will work to maintain the roadways as best we can. This will be done with a combination of low-cost maintenance actions, including crack sealing, pothole repairs, and pavement repairs. You can see the end product of crack sealing on the left and a finished pavement repair on the right. We'll also include the roadways that choose the maintain as is option onto our pavement preservation cycle. This is a program where the department will perform a pavement preservation seal at a certain interval. The seals typically include slurries, micros, or cape seals. And these seals include placement of a mix of oil, sand, and small aggregate that is used at a, as a wearing course on top of an existing roadway. This process was recently done in the West Menlo area, Ladera and Stanford Weekend Acres, and on Alpine Road. So if you're interested to see what the end product is, I suggest you visit one of those areas and take a look. The treatment on that, all those areas was a microsurface. Another recent example was the asphalt rubberized cape seal that was installed last year on Berkeley Ave. Again, this is just a surface treatment and does not include any drainage improvements. At times it has the ability to smooth out roadways, but is generally meant just as a wearing course for the roadway. Photos here show the operation on the left which is the microsurface or slurry seal going down. And on the right, the photo shows what it looks like after it's put down, as well as a comparison to a quarter. So you can see it's not that thick. Now turning our attention towards new roadway standards, the six options we have developed resulted in what we call a reconstruction project. A reconstruction project is a heavy civil engineering project that includes six months of detailed design followed by four to six months of construction per roadway. A reconstruction project will remove the entire roadway down to the sub base, which is anywhere from six to eight inches below the current elevation of the road, rebuild the base and the sub base, install drainage improvements, and put in a new layer of hot mixed asphalt on top. The next set of photos shows a recently project we completed in the North Fair Oaks area, and the photos will show the operation from start to finish. Starting with the photo on the left, the first thing we do is we go in there and remove the existing roadway and the sub base down to our base elevation. And then we come in, compact and grade that so that we have a nice flat, even surface to work with. We then typically modify the sub base with a process called cement treating. Now this is where we set, mix cement with the soil to create a rock hard surface. Once we have a good surface to build off of, we build the base and sub base back and pave a new layer of hot mix asphalt on top. And so the photo on the left shows a typical cement treat machine. So you can see the cement on the left and after on the right, it's mixed with the soil. This thing gets compacted to a rock hard surface. And then we come in and pave a layer of asphalt on top. And this is what you typically see in our roadways, which is a hot mix asphalt. Once the asphalt is placed, we make sure to roll it to make sure it's compacted and meets our specification. And then we work to clean up the area we install any striping, markings, and legends that are needed, and then open it up for public use. 
Now we can move on to the proposed standards that we've adopted. So we've looked at each of the streets and prepared renderings for three of the available options. Now the goal here is to demonstrate to you all how each of the different options will look like and see the potential pros and cons with each. We've tried to take a representative photo that shows the average width of the roadway. Now again, this is just for demonstration purposes and we understand the roadway width varies on some of these roads. So to quickly go over the slide, there is a key map on the bottom left and this shows where in the Menlo Oaks area we are. Um, the first slide will show the existing conditions. Um, as you can see, this is Madison Way and the existing roadway ranges from about 14 feet to 16 feet with an average of about 15 feet wide. There is no improved drainage on either side of the road. Now let me take some time to explain the next set of slides. We're gonna present three options for every single roadway. And again, these slides will be made available online after the meeting, so you can review the streets that interest you in more detail. The first thing we're gonna show is the minimum travel way for the road, which in option one is 16 feet of roadway. For Madison, that would mean widening the existing roadway by six inches on each side. We then show where the two foot wide valley gutters would be installed on either end of the roadway, which you can see by this outside band and the shaded gray area. We did not show the three foot version because we found that the two foot wide valley gutters will be typically enough to convey water. However, if there are certain streets that are prone to nuisance flooding and ponding, we have the option of including the three foot wide valley gutter for more drainage storage and conveyance and allow you to choose that option. So to understand the impacts of the three foot wide valley gutter, we'd basically just extend this another foot on either end. I would like to note that in addition to what we show here, we do need area for construction. And so that includes another six to 12 inches on either side. Um, and we need to add valley gutters to the standards because the, of a waterboard requirement for green infrastructure. And I'll go into that requirement a little bit later on. Um, and again, the impacts are a little bit more. Um, they do need to dig up to put the formwork for the valley gutter. And that's typically anywhere from six to 12 inches um, additional. Another point that I wanna reiterate is that we have no plans on centering the roadway back into the county's right of way. So as you can see from Madison, the roadway looks to be installed shifted to the right based on how much room we have between the fence lines. So we will maintain the existing center line of the roadway as much as possible to limit the impacts. And so with option number one, based on what we're seeing, it looks like the impacts are pretty minimal. Um, in all likelihood, some of these pavers and things like that will need to be removed, but overall the impact is fairly minimal. So the next option is gonna be option three, which is two feet wider on the roadway with the same width of valley gutters. So we go to an 18 foot roadway here, two feet wide valley gutters. And as you can see, as we go right around the roadway, there's a potential for more impacts. We're now definitely affecting these pavers. Uh, we're getting closer to some of this landscaping, things like that. And so these will need to be removed in order for our project to be constructed. And then finally, option five for Madison Way, which is the largest width at 20 feet wide. Now we're starting to get closer to trees, impact more pavers, and potentially the landscaping. At this point, I'd like to expand on the right-of-way and encroachment issue. The right-of-way for Menlo Oaks ranges from 40 to 70 feet, and the county has the right to utilize this right-of-way for the benefit of the public and construction of our roadways. Over the past several years, there have been significant encroachment onto the county's right-of-way, so this was done through building of landscaping, mailboxes, pavers, and things like that. Some of it was through our encroachment permit process, and some of it was done without permits. So all this to say that while impacts from the largest width seem to indicate that we're going in and taking property owners' front yards, we're in fact just using the available right-of-way to construct public improvements. Again, we always try to work with the property owners should we need to take back our right-of-way. And we also have the ability through our detailed design to avoid conflicts. However, I do want to point out that there is a possibility of the county requiring you to remove your improvements for the construction of a road. The next road we're going to take a look at is Peninsula, and the existing road ranges from about 17 and a half to 20 and a half wide with an average of 18 feet and no drainage improvements on either side. Option, shows, option one shows a 16 foot roadway, which is actually two less feet of pavement than current and the two foot wide valley gutters on either end, 
for an overall increase of one foot on the area on either side. Again, based on this photo, the impacts appear to be limited. Option three is 18 foot roadway with two foot wide valley gutters and we start to get wider. So this would be basically maintaining the existing width of the roadway and then building valley gutters on either end. Again, but the impacts seem to be pretty minimal in this option. And then finally, we have the 20 foot option with the two foot wide valley gutters. And here we start to get close to pavers, mailboxes and landscapings. And so option fives and six, which is the three foot wide valley gutters would result in impacts to these features. Menlo Oaks Drive is next. So the current roadway ranges from about 13 and a half to 24 and a half, five, 24 and a half feet wide. And again, the average is about 18 feet and no drainage improvements on either side. Option one shows a 16 foot roadway with a two foot wide valley gutter. Again, in this option, the impacts seem to be limited and the overall footprint is extended by about a foot on either side. Option three for this roadway includes 18 feet of roadway and two foot wide valley gutters. Again, this option would basically keep the current width of the roadway, excuse me, and install valley gutters on the edges. Impacts seem to be very, fairly minimal with this option as well. And then option five includes the widest roadway at 20 feet with the two foot wide valley gutters. As you can see, we are now starting to get near the joint pole or this wooden pole here that typically carries communications and power pole, power lines. Um, the impacts are getting greater, but in the grand scheme of things, these are ones that we can work all around during design. And I'll explain what some of the things that we do to avoid this. Next, we have Berkeley. So the current width ranges from about 13 and a half to 23 and a half feet wide with an average of about 18 feet and no drainage improvements on either end. Again, Berkeley Ave is also the roadway that received the asphalt rubberized Cape Seal last year as part of our payment preservation program, which is again, one of the seals that we would include in the maintain as is option. Option one includes a 16 foot roadway, two foot wide valley gutters. So again, it's about two feet less on the roadway than currently exists. And the overall impact is about a foot on either end. Uh, again, the impacts seem to be minimal. Option three includes 18 feet of roadway with two feet wide valley gutters. And so this would keep the current width and add valley gutters on either end. And the impacts seem fairly minor as well. And then finally, we have the rightest road option, which is the 20 feet wood, 20 foot wide pavement with two feet wide valley gutters. And then this is where the we start to see some potential conflicts, as you can see with the joint poles. Um, and as we're getting close to people's mailboxes and driveways and landscaping. Colby Ave is our next roadway. Current width ranges from about 14 and a half to 22 feet wide with an average of about 18 feet and no drainage improvements on the side. Option one would include a 16 foot wide roadway, two foot wide valley gutters. This would expand the overall width by about one foot on each side and the impacts seem fairly minimal. Option three would maintain the existing roadway width and add the valley gutters on the side, two foot valley gutters. And again, this option has potential conflicts with joint pulls as we're starting to get closer here, um, but they seem fairly minimal. And then finally, option five would include the 20 foot wide roadway and two foot wide valley gutters. So this option shows a conflict with the joint pull as you can see in the left of the photo. So even though there's a potential conflict, that does not mean that we cannot engineer a way out of it. In instances like this, we have a few options available to us. Number one would be to design around the joint pole so that there's a small area that has a curve. I'll show what that looks like in detail later, but basically we would curve the valley gutter around this joint pole. So that way we can keep it in place and not have to move it. The other option available to us would actually be to move or shift the street to the other side of the roadway. So we would shift the alignment in this area if there is available space here by whatever is needed to maintain uh, the width. So with this option, we're able to maintain the width of the roadway throughout the entire corridor. And then the third option we have is we can work with the utilities to have the pole moved. Uh, this is a last resort for us because it usually it takes a lot of lead time and it's challenging based on where the pole is located and who's connected to the pole. Typical people on the pole include PG&E, AT&T, Comcast, things like that. Sometimes they have street lights. 
So some there's also potential um, with moving the pole that there'll be line of sight issues and there'll be tree trimming required to run the new um, overhead lines. Again, this is a last resort for us for many reasons, um, and the main one being that it would likely delay our project because based on pg and &E and other utilities response time and workload. And so this is the next road on our list. This is Arlington Way, but this is the section between Coleman Ave and the 90 degree turn. Current width is about 15 and a half to 20 and a half feet wide with an average of an 18 foot and no drainage improvements on the sides. Option one would reduce the roadway to 16 feet, add the two foot wide valley gutters and the impacts seem to be minimal. Uh, option three, would keep the roadway at the 18 feet it is now and build the valley gutters on the edges. Again, impacts seem to be minimal with this option. And then finally, option five is the 20 foot wide roadway with two feet wide valley gutters. And so here you see to start to see some minor impacts to the landscaping at the far end of the photo and potentially to some shoulder parking where you see the car parked. Next, we have Entrada Way, which has an existing width of 18 feet for the entire way length and no drainage improvements. Option one would reduce the roadway to 16 feet, add the two feet wide valley gutters, extend the overall footprint by one foot on either side, and the impacts seem to be fairly minimal with this option. Option three would keep the existing 18 foot roadway and add the two foot wide valley gutters. And again, the impacts are gonna be limited to landscaping and potentially some of the shoulder parking areas. And then finally, option five would be the biggest at 20 foot wide roadway and two feet wide valley gutter. And again, I don't see any impacts to trees or utility poles or anything like that, and mainly just front yard landscaping um, and uh, shoulder parking. So then we have the second segment of Arlington Way, which is from Ringwood Ave to the turn. So this is an existing roadway that is 22 feet wide and constant width, and it has a existing two foot wide curb and gutter on the left or south side of the roadway and no drainage improvements on the north side or the right side of the photo. For this street, we developed one option for consideration, and that would be to reduce the roadway from the 22 feet to 20 feet, and then install a two foot wide valley gutter to the right side of the street. We decided to reduce the roadway here due to the potential conflicts with the palm tree in the photo above. And for the folks that are in attendance that live on Arlington Way in this segment, Please let us know if you'd like to explore other options with either a larger or smaller width of roadway, and you can contact us directly or through the survey comments section. Our contact information will be available at the end of the presentation. Frederick Court is our next, next unique roadway. This was likely put in by a developer uh, when the homes were built, and the existing condition is 22 feet of roadway with two foot rolled curb and gutter on either end of the side, either end of the street. Again, for this option, we pr are proposing that uh, we keep the existing roadway and rolled curb gutter in place. And the option presented for this roadway would be to maintain as is, which means we would come in, repair potholes, crack seal and perform seals at the appropriate interval. Again, if anybody is in attendance from the Frederick Court area and you feel differently, please let us know through the contact information at the end of the presentation or through the survey comments. So now I'm gonna go over some of the design solutions to impacts that I discussed about earlier that our department reviews on a case-by-case -case basis. The biggest impact that we typically see are gonna be trees, landscaping, and encroachments into the county's right-of-way. As I mentioned earlier, Menlo Oaks has a lot of unpermitted improvements in the county's right-of-way, and so we anticipate having to deal with these. So this is a photo of Menlo Oaks Drive, and the, you can see the large amount of trees um, that are sited on the edge of the roadway. So the first conflict would be the tree on the left of the photo. And here we can either shift the, the valley gutter to curve around the tree, which would make the actual roadway smaller than the standard that is adopted, but would allow us to not impact the tree um, and protect it from our construction. So we can either shift and curve the valley gutter around it, or we can actually shift the center line of the road. And so another option is if we have the available space on the right side, what we can do is shift the road by a foot and maintain the width of 18 feet, 16 feet, or 20 feet, whichever you guys choose. 
And then another option we have available to us, uh, which we show over here, is we can actually stop the valley gutter if the tree is in the direct alignment with the valley gutter and we don't have an ability to go around it or shift the center line. We can actually stop the valley gutter short, uh, do some other type of treatment around the trees that has less impact, and then start the valley gutter back up on the other end. In this example, we show Berkeley Avenue. Again, here's another tree in the way that we can curve the valley gutter around and potentially narrow the roadway to protect the existing tree. Uh, or we can stop the valley gutter short and pick it up on the other end. And then here's an example where we would be impacting landscaping. So again, this is Menlo Oaks Drive. And during situations like this, you can see that there's some impacts to the existing landscape and vegetation on both sides of the road. And so in situations like this, we work with individual property owners to identify the impact. We would then allow the property owner to either salvage or remove the landscaping ahead of our project. If they, if they choose not to, we'll ask our contractor to do it for them. And then we can either provide the landscaping to the property owner or have the contractor dispose of it. Depending on that specific area, we try to avoid impacting landscaping and improvements if there's a way to keep our standard. However, there are times where we cannot shift the roadway or we need the area for construction and we need to remove the landscaping from the and removing the landscaping from the right of way is the only available option to us. Other issues that we want to inform you about during this process so that we have no plans of installing an underground storm drain system as part of this effort. All the drainage improvements will be surface improvements and are meant to convey surface water in the valley gutters. Again, we do have a California Water Board requirement for green infrastructure on these types of projects, which I will cover in detail shortly. Another area of concern is sanitary sewer laterals. So these are the pipes that connect your home sinks, showers, baths, and toilets to the sewer main in the street. <clears throat> West Bay Sanitary Sewer District is the provider in the area, and the county will not be replacing or paying for any cost for sanitary sewer work as part of this effort. The property owner is 100% responsible for their sewer lateral. Issues that we've encountered in the past include shower, shallow sewer laterals or broken sewer laterals. And so should a sewer lateral be found to be shallow or broken, we'll ask that the property owner lower it to the appropriate depth or repair it. If they do not, the project will do the work and then we'll bill the property owner for the cost. In terms of cost for the property owner for the work in constructing the roadway standards, should they be adopted? The county will pay 100% of the costs for the options presented. Any work on driveways and shoulders will be limited to the minimum needed for construction. We typically include up to five feet of conform work on a shoulder or driveway if it is needed, and anything past this will be the property owner's responsibility. Based on how flat the area is, we do not anticipate any driveway conform issues related to grade differences, um, meaning that we don't expect any differences in the elevation between our finished roadway and your current driveway that would make your car bottom out as you enter or exit your driveway. However, we, we will determine this through more detailed design if it moves forward. Uh, traffic calming devices or analysis was not included in this process. Uh, the department has an existing approved process where you can request a residential speed control device analysis of your road. Information on that process is available on DPW website. And if you Google San County of San Mateo residential speed control device, you'll be shown the page where you can submit a request. And trees are the next big items and I'm sure a major concern for you all. So we understand that impacts to trees are a significant concern from a community named Menlo Oaks. Based on option six, which is the largest impact at 20 feet of roadway and three foot wide valley gutters on either end, for a total footprint or width of 26 feet. We have reviewed the impacts to trees and found the following potential impacts based on our desktop review. So what we did is we reviewed the topography of the current roadway limits and compared them to the option six. Um, happy to say Arlington Way, Entrada Way, and Fredwood Court would have zero impact to trees for all the six options. Colby Ave at one and Peninsula Way at two have minimal impacts and historically we've been able to work around these types of impacts without having to remove or endanger the tree as I showed earlier in the presentation through a combination of shifting the roadway alignment or curving around the tree. For Madison Way there's a total of four trees and these are located near the intersection of Menlo Oaks Drive and mainly conflict for the 18 and 20 foot roadway width options. 
However, we believe we can narrow the width of the roadway here to avoid impacting these trees for all the options. So the roadway would be a little bit narrower than the adopted standard that is chosen if that's the where we end up and we're able to avoid these trees and then it would widen out to whatever the standard is. For Berkeley Avenue, all five of these trees are located near the edge of the roadway and where the valley gutter would be placed. And we believe we can work to avoid these by curving the roadway and valley gutters around the trees or eliminating the valley gutter on either end of the trees. Of note are the two large trees as you turn onto Berkeley from Bay Road in the Little Dirt Median. So these, tr these trees would be in the direct line of a proposed valley gutter. And in a situation like this, we would look into shifting the center line of the roadway towards the other side of the street to avoid the trees. And based on what we saw, it looks like there is uh, available room there. And then finally, Menlo Oaks has the most at 14 potential impacted trees. Again, these are generally located at the edge of the roadway and would be impacted by the installation of the valley gutter. So we do our best to try to avoid the trees by curving around them and shifting the center line of the roadway where possible. But with this many impacts, it could get challenging during design. And so a smaller footprint and width on Medio, Menlo Oaks Drive would result in less impacts to the existing trees. So now let's discuss the drainage considerations and conditions in Menlo Oaks. The area does not have an underground storm drain system to collect and convey stormwater. Stormwater currently flows along the roadway shoulders, and many of the shoulders are permeable. There are several areas in the neighborhood that experience localized ponding at low points and in the shoulder areas. Being that the shoulder areas are permeable, this allows the water to sink into the ground after a few days. Now, in terms of what drainage improvements you can accept from the, expect from these options, if you choose to maintain as is, there will be no drainage improvements on your street as part of the any roadway work. The existing drainage patterns will remain. Any drainage improvements will need to be through a separate effort and based on the priority of the department and the county. Historically, the department has not had a funding source to prioritize drainage improvements after programming all of our other priorities for work. Now, if you choose to move forward with a roadway standard, so one of the options one through six, we will be installing either two or three foot wide valley gutters. And these are intended to collect water from the roadway and convey it more efficiently. The valley gutters will reduce ponding from the normal storm, which is a two or five year storm. They're not intended to eliminate all the drainage issues. And if we have a storm like we did at the end of 2022, the valley gutters will be overwhelmed and flooding ponding will occur. The design will also need to include the evaluation of subsurface storage and treatment based on the requirements from the California Water Board. So green infrastructure is something that will be a requirement for any of the options that you select, except for the maintain as is option. So options one through six will trigger a GI requirement for the project because we're gonna be digging up the roadway and that is a trigger for this. That means that we'll need to treat the stormwater through one or more several different available systems. One system that we've used in the past are these subsurface systems pictured above. So these are sub installed underneath the roadway and meant as a way to collect stormwater during um, storms. So they're sited in the roadway and installed underneath and between existing utilities. Uh, the design can get challenging at times based on what we have in the ground. Uh, we have to avoid gas lines, sanitary sewer laterals, things like that. And so finding areas for these can become challenging, but when, when we do have the room, they're very good at treating and collecting stormwater. So not only do they provide the benefit of treatment, but they also act as storage and recharge to groundwater, and that will help with ponding during the storms. Again, all these systems are intended to treat the two to five year storm, which is a minor storm and not expected to fix all the drainage issues in the area. And green infrastructure is one of the main driving forces of the requirement that we have valley gutters for all the options that we're presenting. We need a way to convey the water to an area where we can treat it in this type of system. And a valley gutter is gonna be the best way for us to do that. And why we need to include some type of drainage improvements if you select options one through six. So now I wanna take some time to go over the survey that we're gonna be sending out to you in the next few days. The slide shows the survey and the information we're gonna be asking you. I'll go over the information that is necessary in detail and how you select the options that you desire. So part one of the survey includes the contact information. So the survey will be sent to property owners and not tenants. 
and only pe people listed as owners will be allowed to provide a response to the survey, and we will only count one survey per home. So first we ask you to fill out your contact information, including your assessor's parcel number, or APN, and the APN will be provided to you on the mailing label on the envelope that we include with the survey. We also ask for an email address that you can provide so that an email address so that we can provide you with updates on the process. And then please note that the survey results will need to be dropped off at our office or postmarked by December 6th to be counted. And that is exactly four weeks from today. So now for the important part, part two. This is the voting portion of the survey. We ask you to fill out part A first. The question being, do you want street improvements on my street? If you vote no, that means you're finished with the survey. Public Works will perform the expanded definition of maintain as is, will pothole, crack seal, and perform pavement repairs, and add your roadway to our pavement preservation program for a seal to be completed at a future date. No drainage improvements will be included in the pavement preservation work, and the work is completed on a cycle that is currently running about 13 years. So that means that once every 13 years, all the roads that are included in the pavement preservation cycle receive some kind of treatment. Um, in the meantime, we'll continue to perform pothole repairs and crack sealing as needed. Another key note here is our survey is not received from a property owner. That is considered the same as a maintain as is vote. So even if you want to maintain as is, please, park, please mark no for part A and return your survey so that there's no ambiguity on what the community wants. We ask that you reach out and talk to your neighbors to send the survey back to us. We want to get 100% participation so that we can get an accurate representation of what Menlo Oaks wants. So if you are interested in moving forward with adopting new standards, then what you'll need to do is mark yes to part A and then move on to part B. Part B asks you to rank the six options presented from one being the most preferred to six being the least preferred. The goal of this portion is that for the department to better understand what the community desires in terms of improvements. Do you want a new roadway and drainage with a, the least amount of impact? That means you should vote for option one or two, which would be 16 foot of roadway with two feet wide or three foot wide valley gutters. And this would have the least amount of impact. Or do you want a new roadway that's wide and you wanna convey a lot of stormwater? Then you should vote for option six as your preferred alternative. This would include 26 feet of impact, 20 feet of roadway, three feet of valley gutters on each side. And then based on the results of this survey, we're gonna, the department will analyze to see if any of the options we presented should be removed from consideration when we come back to the community for our second meeting. The second page of the survey includes a section for you to write in comments. Please let us know anything else that we should be aware of. This can be roadway specific, like there's a gas valve in the middle of our street, to more general in nature. Please let us know if there are other standards that we should be considering or if we missed the mark. We will be reviewing these comments and provide responses to common themes at the next meeting. So the survey is gonna be mailed out to you this week and should arrive soon. You can also download a copy of the survey from our website. We'll be providing a link at the end of the presentation to our website where you'll be able to find a copy of the survey. If you visit our website, you can also click the subscribe for updates by clicking on a link and you'll be pinged whenever we post anything new on the website related to this project. Again, please submit the surveys to our office or have them postmarked by December 6th for them to be counted. The results will be based on a one vote per property basis and the survey results, recommended road options, response to comments received, and a priority list will be presented in the second community meeting that will be scheduled for early 2024 after we get through the holidays. One idea that we've been discussing internally is setting up some office hours for you all to stop by to ask questions, get more detail, and to drop off surveys. So before we set anything up, we'd like to gauge your interest in having something scheduled and before the surveys are due. If you'd be interested in having office hours in person, virtually, or on site at the local school, please reach out to us via email. We'll provide contact information shortly. Based on the level of interest, we'll determine if something like that should be scheduled. Now, in terms of how we're going to determine the results of the surveys, we will require that at least 50% plus one in order for us to revise the roadway standards in the area. 
We again ask you to get your vote out so we can have an accurate reflection from the community. We will be reviewing the standards on a road by road basis, meaning that if Colby votes for standards and Madison does not, we'll move forward with updating road standards for Colby and we'll maintain Madison as is. So there is a possibility that there's going to be a mix of results and we'll work with the residents who want improvements on their streets and maintain the other roads in the current width. So this concludes my presentation. I want to thank you for attending tonight and I'll be turning it back over to Nate to facilitate the question and answer portion of today's meeting. Thanks, Christoph. So that's that concludes the presentation tonight. So right now we want to hear from all the attendees. So um, we're going to move to question and answer. If you would like to uh, submit a question or uh, comment verbally, then you can raise your hand in Zoom at this time. We're going to go ahead and pick on everyone individually. Uh, when I pick on you, you'll be able to unmute your microphone. Um, if you are dialing in, then you can use star nine to raise your hand um, if, you, if you're using uh, your phone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, going through the raised hands right now. So right now I've got a raised hand um, from Jim. So Jim, um, I am going to ask you to unmute your microphone and you can speak right now, your question or comment. Thank you. This is Jim Bird. I live at 940 Colby. I'm on the MOTA board and part of the roads committee. Um, it seems that in addition to, well, only road widths were given as options for our neighborhood residents to, to vote on. And I was wondering, was no consideration to giving any other options as to how the roads would be repaired, reconstructed. I know in the past when speaking with people in the county, they, they had other than a, a full rebuild of the road, which seems to be what you're talking about going down eight inches to a foot with a you know a real full reconstruction, that there were other options that might be considered for some of the roads, such as a two inch grind with two inches or so of asphalt put back over. Whether it's that option or not, were any other options as to how the roads are reconstructed? And again, I'm not talking about width. Were any other options to how the roads are reconstructed considered? Or is this, or we're only really getting one option when it comes to that in, in regards to our road standards? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, we did look into our typical process for road work. So we looked into the basics, which is the maintain as is and the seals. Uh, we looked at resurfacing, which includes either an overlay or a grind and pave or, or mill and fill is what we call it. And then we looked into the reconstructions. And the reason we rolled out the resurfacing or overlay projects is because that does not include any um, drainage improvements. Um, typically, we do not do resurfacings or overlays on roads that do not have a structural section. So that's one reason that we ruled that out. Putting pavement like that in an area that does not have a engineered base and subbase leads it to fail more quickly. And so we do not get our return on investment that we would typically inspect for that type of operation. Um, additionally, um, we included drainage as an option um, and, and typically on a resurfacing project, you don't do any kind of drainage improvements. And we wanna include drainage because water is another um, common source of deterioration on our roadways. And so um, that's the main, re those are the two main reasons that we ruled out a resurfacing or an overlay as one of the options available. Okay, thank am I still on the Okay, yeah. thank you. In terms of speed mitigations, I know one of the concerns of many members of our neighborhood is that with improved road conditions, there will be faster cars, more cars on the street. And, you know, we have the high school nearby and we get a lot of kids coming down into our neighborhood. And certainly the conditions on some of the roads like Menlo Oaks greatly reduces the ability to go fast because of, of the you know conditions of the road there. And it sounds from what I heard from from this from you was that if we wanted any speed mitigation considered, whether it's 
you know, whatever technology is used, that that is a whole separate process. It isn't guaranteed and we would have to apply for that. And there's no guarantee anything like that would ever even happen. And that we might just get the new roads and nothing would be put in to help slow down traffic. Is that correct? Correct. The traffic calming or mitigation is not included as part of this process. We have a separate and distinct process that our traffic engineering group oversees that would address any kind of traffic calming requests on a road by road basis. Okay. And finally, I'll let someone else talk, but I'm, I'm a little concerned that the survey is going out so soon um, without, you know, within, you know, as you said, within a week, because this is going to be complex and there's going to be a lot of people, a lot, you know, the majority of, the, of our neighbors are not on this Zoom today. And I think there needs to be more county effort to get information out to the community for a longer period of time before an actual survey goes out and people, because some people will be scared, they won't really understand it, and they're just going to vote or do nothing. Whereas if they understand it, they may say, oh, this is an option, or obviously the opposite. Once they understand it, they may also say, do nothing. But it just seems to me that putting this survey out, the, the community is not really going to be ready to make you know a decision at this this juncture without more time to really digest this and to whether it's meeting with the county or more information being sent out. For example, you may live in a section that's on the narrower side and want to know how it's going to impact the four or five houses on either side of your property. And if that's not included in your little slide set, how is someone going to really be able to figure that out? Yeah. Uh Point well taken. I mean, we are going to po post this survey or the presentation and this question and answer portion online. We'll also provide a updated email sharing the online presentation to the mailing list we have. Um, but we do want to ask for your guys' assistance and getting the word out as much as possible. Um, additionally, we we are happy to have, like I said, office hours, and whether that's here at the county office, whether that's virtually, or whether that's at the local school, before the surveys are due, we can set up additional office hours where we can have some folks out there, we'll have the presentation available, we'll be happy to answer any kind of specific questions you have, and we can also collect surveys at that point. Well, I would put out there and recommend we consider delaying sending out the survey till we can get MODA can get information out to the community and the count and with the county's help, we can make sure that the majority of the people who live in Menlo Oaks at least have had a chance to look at your this this you know Zoom today or get a chance to call in with any questions they have before the survey going out. You know, at the beginning of the holidays, people are going to be busy, they're back and forth. I think this is important enough that we should have more time for people to get their answers question before feeling pressured to get it in, you know, in just, you know, six weeks or less, weeks. you know, four weeks. That just doesn't feel like enough time on on a decision that could really have a drastic impact on a lot of the people in this neighborhood. I, I don't think it's enough time. That's my opinion, but I'd like to be able to get input from our community on that subject if the county is willing to at least hear back from us before sending it out. Yeah, definitely. I would recommend you, um, we'll have our contact information in the next slide. Um, definitely, we're, we're taking note of the comments here um, and we can take that under consideration. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so I've got a raised hand from Raymond. Um, I'm gonna allow you to talk ask you to unmute your microphone, Raymond. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. It's actually Ramon. Okay, Raymond sorry. is spelled R-A-Y-M-O-N-D. Um, anyway, um, here, neither here nor there. Um, so I'm curious, so um, adding the gutters, how much more water are you, 
um, expecting to convey out of the neighborhood. I'm assuming that the maybe the difference between two feet and three feet is 50% more. Um, but how does it compare to what currently um, being conveyed off? So we have I, I know a lot of people have wells in the area, and I'm going to imagine that at the current levels that a, a fair amount of water is percolating back into the ground, feeding those wells. Sure. Um, so our overall goal is not to convey water away from the area. It's to convey it to green infrastructure sites where it's then treated and then put back into the ground. And so the the intent of the Valley Getters, again, is for some of the smaller storms, so like a two and five year storm. Uh, what we'll do is we'll site these green infrastructure features along each of the roadways as a way to collect the stormwater, treat it, and then recharge groundwater in the area. So the actual conveyance of water out of the Menlo Oaks area, I would say would be fairly minimal overall. Uh, it would likely just be maybe at the ends near Bay, um, the diff, you know, the, the, the length between the last green infrastructure feature we install and then connecting to whatever's on Bay. Okay, so there, it's more like a French drain then? Yeah, it's like a more engineered solution. So, I mean, they're they're much more sophisticated. They have treatment. So, sure. um, you know, there's certain things that we put in to treat, but overall they it does retain and, and is more of a storage. And then it eventually percolates down into the groundwater. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have a... A uh, question here from Stephen. Stephen, we're asking you to unmute your microphone. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I'm a I'm a member of the board, um, and and I have the good fortune of being president of the board as well, and. Um, just for those listening on the call, this is an effort that we have been aware from the board level that's been ongoing with the county um, for uh, for at least two years now. And I'd like to congratulate the county on a very um, clear presentation and analysis uh, and, and the outcome of the effort to address road standards within Menlo Oaks. I think it was a good presentation and one that I think is very clear for our residents to, to comprehend and to debate. Um, I think with respect to the timing of the survey that's been brought up, um, we will discuss this at the board level, but I suspect we will offer the community um, a, some type of meeting in the very near future, uh, certainly before the end of the year and, and likely before December 6th, uh, but we can discuss this more um, to have a broader outreach on our side from the board uh, to update everyone about what the county now has put together since this recording is going to be made available. So that that's just the comment I'd like to make that the, the board will try to facilitate discussion and communication um, as, as best we can with members in the community so they can be educated that may include um, a community meeting just to go through this again. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Got a question from John. I'm asking you to unmute your microphone. Hi, thank you. This is John Danforth. I live Hi. on Mellow Oaks Drive. Um, I've got a request and a couple of questions. Um, my request is that when you send out the survey, survey, you make clear to people that maintenance involves uh, maintenance on a fairly, you know, more often than 13 years and can include the kind of surface treatment that we already have seen on Berkeley, because there have been communications both from the county and frankly from MODA that have implied that if we don't approve options one through six, we kind of have to live with what we've got. And that, I know that's not what you're saying, but I think that's been communicated to the community. And so my request is that you make it really clear when you 
send out the surveys that keeping things as is does not mean potholes, cracks, or even the current surface. The question I have, and I'm just going to limit myself to one question. Um, when you evaluate the, the risk to trees, are you all also looking at the impact on the root structure of some of our oak trees when you dig down eight inches and tear up the existing road? Yeah, so let me answer the, the first question. Um, yes, an asphalt rubberized chip seal is one of the options in the maintain as is. However, I don't want to overpromise. Uh, it's based on the condition of the roadway. And what we'll do is evaluate to see what the best treatment is based on the current condition of the roadway. As far as the 13 year interval, um, unfortunately, that's just it, it is what it is. We have 320 miles of roads that we maintain and the majority are those roads the payment preservations program is the only way we treat them and so we go area by area every year and based on our budget each year and the amount of roads we hit every road once every 13 years is what we're projecting right now uh, for the tree question we work with the county arborist whenever we do a project prior to the start of the project we engage the arborist and we have them go out and provide us a report for every single tree that we feel may be impacted by the work in addition to the report we have certain things that we make the contractor do to make sure that we limit or minimize any kind of disturbance or impacts to trees uh, we have buffers that we include in some of the trees they need to do handwork around roots there's a special way of cutting roots if they are in conflict and so we do have certain things that we have in our toolbox to limit any kind of impacts to trees so christoph this is john danforth again i, I do want to ask my second question then um it seems to me that we're being asked to vote on this before we know what the arborist evaluation is going to be or before we know whether the valley gutters can be rooted around uh, some or all of the 14 trees on my street, for example. And I'm wondering if we can't get clarity on that before we're asked to vote. The other thing I would like to call to the county's attention is even my street is dramatically different between Bay Street and, say, Colby or Bay and Peninsula, which has most of the 14 trees you're talking about versus between, say, Coleman and, I don't know, closer to the high school, which has almost no threatened trees. So what I'd like the county to think about is a further um, level of uh, granularity where you look at how people are responding based on where they live in a particular part of a tree, of a street. I suspect my neighbors on my part of Menlo Oaks are not going to want to give up our 14 trees. Yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, no, we, we, the detailed design is where we really take a close look at the trees because it is um, a significant cost and effort. Um, to your point, we do look at it on a block by block basis. And so ultimately what we've done in other areas is they'll be, even through this process, we won't just pick one standard for a road will typically give you four to five. And then when it's time for your road to come up, we'll actually come back to you on a street specific community meeting where you guys will then get to choose of the four adopted standards, which ones you want on a block by block basis. So there is a possibility that on Berkeley, the first section gets a 16 foot roadway. And then as it widens out and there's less conflicts and the, those neighbors choose a 18 foot roadway, we have the ability to do that. This is John, I think I was unclear. What I meant was, is it possible that one block of Menlo Oaks Drive would say, keep it as is. And the other blocks can say, we like option one, two, three, four, five, or six. At this point, we're keeping it on a street by street basis, but we can definitely take that under consideration and and see if that makes sense. Um, and we can report back at the second meeting. Thank you. But, mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, John. Okay, I've got a raised hand from Mark. I'm going to 
ask you to unmute your unmute your microphone, Mark. Great, thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for the presentation and the work done to date. Um, very much appreciated. So maybe going back to one of the earlier points and questions raised in terms of speed mitigation, uh, that is a concern that has already been brought up. It's a concern I know that many neighbors face. Is there a opportunity to address speed mitigation concerns concurrently with this work versus after the fact? Um, I asked because I think that would potentially or could change um, how neighbors vote uh, on how to move forward. I'm assuming traffic mitigation would be possible, but the way you sort of teed it up, it made it seem like um, it, it may not be possible. Yeah, so we're considering those two independent processes. Uh, the road standards are meant to discuss and adopt the actual standard for the roadway and anything kind of above ground, we work through our existing process that we have in place for traffic mitigation. So no, we do not believe that those can be done in parallel. You can request uh, an evaluation of your roadway at any time. And so in a way, if you put in the request that can be done, but um, they will not be included as part of any kind of roadway standards that'll go to the board. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mark. Okay, I'm going to call in. I've got a question from Greg. Greg, I've asked you to Thank unmute you. your microphone. All yeah. right. Should be unmuted now. Yep. Thank you so much. So I had a couple of questions. One was, first of all, can you elaborate a little bit on the actual voting process for us? It sounds like we need 51% to actually vote yes or no. And then when we count the votes, is it is it only gonna be the people that have said yes or no that are gonna be considered in terms of the up down vote or is there something broader than that? Um, yes, so if you vote, you we need, it's on a street by street basis. 50, you need 50% plus one, and of those people, they would select the options that they prefer, and then we would come back and, and present those as a subsequent meeting. So the people that want standards um, would then select the of the available options. So I'm still a little confused then. So does that mean that we need to have 51% vote to make a change in order to get a change made? Or do yes. we only need 51% to say, to actually respond to the survey? No, you need to have 51% of people say they want improvements for us to adopt any kind of improvements. Otherwise, we will just maintain the roadway as is. And what happens for the people that don't vote because they may not even live here, but have a house here or? Those um, are counted as no votes. Okay. They're counted the same as do not want a standard and maintain as is. Okay. So, yeah, so that's where we ask you to do what you can to get the vote out. I mean, we we have the contact information for the owners, and that's where we'll be sending all of the, that's where we have been sending and we'll be sending the surveys. And uh, we can, you know, when we report out on the second meeting, we'll let you guys know exactly um, how many votes we received. Got it. And versus um, how many. Two other quick there. questions based on the other questions that have been raised. One is, do you have a estimate of the number of trees that'll be affected if it's a 16 foot roadway with a two foot gutter on Menlo Oaks? Cause I think you showed the, the widest street with the widest gutter affecting 14 trees. Yeah, um, I don't have that number offhand, but we can take a look at the um, the different options for, for the roads that do have affected trees. Um, and I think that would be really helpful to have the analysis so that we can all consider it because I do think the impact on trees is something that a lot of people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, in terms of the speed mitigation, is there any comments you can give us in terms of how difficult it is to get speed mitigation in place to the extent that people vote on it? I mean, there's there's a number of streets nearby that that have it in place. So is that something that, that's a challenge or is that something that's that's pretty easily done within the county? 
are you talking about the the existing process of requesting yeah. it and see um i am actually not too familiar with what that process looks like um if you google the website it, it has an explanation of exactly what it is i believe there's an assessment that needs to happen and our traffic engineering folks take a look and see what can be done but i i really can't say what the you know success percentages of applications versus ultimate improvements but we can um we can check in with our traffic folks. Okay. If not, we could probably have the folks from Moda follow up on that a little bit as we think about the, the future meetings with the community. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Okay. I've got a, I've got a uh, question from Chelsea. I'm asking you to unmute. Hi, yeah, so I um, thank you for the presentation. This is wonderful, very clear. Um, also a resident on Menlo Oaks Drive. And um, my, I have two questions. The first is, if the center of the road is, and, and the road itself is up against a property line and is not currently... Um, there's not space that is considered right of way compared to where the property line and where the current road is. Would that road in that section, would the center line then be shifted if there was space on the other side? Or how is that dealt with when the property line and the road are meeting? Yeah, so there, we would work to put the roadway within our existing right-of-way mm -hmm. and so we would shift it away from if there are instances and i think there are a few instances uh where we're actually outside of our right-of-way through this process and through that um, project we would move the roadway back into our right-of-way by shifting it towards the other side of the street right for lack of a better word Awesome. So my second question is on the areas of the roads that are currently in that 13 foot range and then also have a tree on the edge of the road. You mentioned the two ways that you could deal with that in, you know, changing the valley gutter, going around, stopping it and restarting it um, and also reducing the size of the road potentially. Can you get a little bit more specific on that? Because if we're in an area where the road is already significantly reduced, then we're also re potentially reducing it more. And we're in an area of a road that is bending around multiple trees. How does that work in the long run? So we would look at it on a case by case basis. Um, Generally, what we've seen from our field surveys is it would be basically like a pinch point in the roadway, right? So the specific area where it would be 13 and a half feet. First, we'd look to see if we can expand it to the other side of the tree. If not, then there's a potential that, you know, we would use what's a, the available room that's there and build what we can. And then that would just be a pinch point along the road. Uh, and so we would just kind of look at it on a case by case basis. Um, I mean, we can't really tell right now what that would look like overall because it's just that that comes through our detailed design. Um, but there is a possibility that the road would, you know, meander kind of around these trees uh, to avoid them. Is there a consideration taken into um the health of the tree or um, things like that in terms of how that's going to happen. For instance, I'm aware of a tree that's right on the road, has a lot of um, visible things going on with it that we have not been able to get approval for fixing. And it is definitely within the either it needs to have some maintenance or something's going to happen with it um, but it's also on the side edge of the road 
um, how is that going to be considered in the moving forward process? Because it is currently a pinch point and it sounds like it's going to continue to be a pinch point. Yeah, so um, my computer's kind of freezing. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, there are times when we go and talk to our arborist and he has identified trees that are either dying or dead. And his recommendation would be to remove the tree if it poses a safety hazard for the public. Um, so again, we would take a look on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if the tree is in a condition where it's in good condition and, and has no disease, isn't dying, isn't dead, we will do everything we can to keep that in place. Um, but there have been occasions on past projects where we are we do remove trees that are that pose a safety hazard. One last follow up question: um, Considering the minimum from fire and other safety um, personnel, emergency personnel is sixteen feet. How how do we reconcile the thirteen foot road? Um, and and all the massive amounts of construction that we have going on here and all of those things for keeping our community safe and accessible for emergency personnel. Yeah, so talking with EMS, I mean, that is their recommended minimum, but they understand that, you know, we live in the real world and there's certain areas where we can't meet that minimum. I think their goal is to try to maintain that minimum for as much of the roadways as possible. And they're always able to navigate the smaller areas or the, the pinch points. Um, and so that's kind of how we deal it. I mean, there's other areas within the county where we run into similar circumstances and we'll do everything we can to kind of maintain the minimum width, which is why we are also, you know, give ourselves the ability to shift the road and things like we, we only narrow it as if it's one of the last resorts available to us because we do want to maintain that access, not only for EMS, but for, you know, your, you as well as you're traveling so you don't have to pull off and, and wait for others to pass kind of thing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, I've got a I've got a raise hand from Ramona. Hi. Hi. Um my name is Ramona and I um live on Arlington Way. And I have uh, I'm part of the Moda board and um have been through this process um for many years talking about um how we could mitigate sp um speed and have been part of the conversations about the high school and um, speeding in the area. We have never been able to meet the um, standards of the Public Works Department for speed control. But in 1998, when we rebuilt Coleman, part of the road standards and the agreement was to put the circles in to slow down traffic. Um, but it sounds like you're not going to allow that kind of mitigation to happen um, in this road standard change. I understand that we're talking about the structure and really the building of the road and not the surfaces above, but the impact of you changing the condition of the road, especially on my end of Arlington and um, the high school side from Coleman to um, Ringwood for uh, Menlo Oaks, it's it's as if we want to have two different standards for two different parts of the neighborhood based on the neighbor's concerns. So my concern is, is that there are um, a community on the Menlo in the 100 to 400 block of Menlo Oaks that might prefer one thing and then from this um, 500 block down to the other end on Berkeley where so much of the road has been torn up by new construction you you actually have two different sort of mindsets because 
because of the different uses of those roads. So I really think that you guys should consider breaking up um, those, that, especially Menlo Oaks, when you're thinking about this survey, because I don't know if you can get 50% one way or the other. Um, anyways, um, so that is my concern. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, yes. Just yeah. want to make sure. Um, so, so that is one thing that I want you to consider is that, um, for us, you're telling us that we're going to get a faster roadway, a smoother roadway, and we're not going to get any way to, we're not going to get any more enforcement than we do now. And we're not going to have any way to keep them from drag racing down the now new 20 foot wide Arlington way with you know, maybe three feet of gutter on either side. And so this has been a problem since the high school in 1957 went in. Um, my um, family, my husband's family has been here since then. And so our biggest concern is that, um, you know, you're not, you're not even giving us the option to um, want to have smoother roads. That being said, um, I was wondering about this green infrastructure that you're talking about. Currently, especially on Arlington, we don't have a great amount of drainage problems, but we do get puddles. The kids enjoy playing in them. But um, I'm just wondering whether this green infrastructure has to go in every 50 feet. What What is your measure or your metric for? Um, it looks like it was more than six to eight inches down for that infrastructure to go in. And I was wondering if it's, you know, so many cubic yards. And so every 50 feet, we have to have one of these and try to fit it into our roadway. Or is it a different measurement or metric than that? No, so it's based off of the watershed and the anticipated rain. There's a certain storm that we need to treat. And so we will we do that analysis on a um, road by road basis. And typically what we'll do is cite it at the interval where we where we have to install base the minimum amount needed to meet that requirement. And so typically what we've seen on past projects is it'll be three, three to four locations generally spaced at the same interval that then catches the water. Right, and then we, I just want to add that then there's a lot of underground utilities that we have to take into account too, so we cannot uh, impact underground utilities, so only where there is a clear space underground where we would be able to put these infrastructures, so it's not space evenly, it has to be evaluated um, street by street based on the existing um, utilities and um, even above ground uh, improvements. And and so my question then is, is if where all that lands is where the mature oak tree that has been growing forever, and of course no utilities went around it, does that mean that you've got to build and dig down, you know, uh, that, that person looked like they were inside um, and their feet, you know, it looked like three feet or more deep below the road structure. So are you considering that these things need to go in where there's not utilities and not mature oak trees, or is that not going to be a part of the conversation? No, we, we'll avoid all trees and, and impacting trees. So we wouldn't you know, pull out a tree to put one of these in. Additionally, that is just one of the options available to us. We have several different kinds that are less impact um, and and so it's a combination. I mean, we, we really, we can't say exactly what's going to go in per road, but there are different options available to us that have different footprints, different depths, uh, configurations, and the goal is using a combination of all of them to meet that requirement. But we would not remove a tree to put in a, a green infrastructure, um, anything. Uh, I'm not saying that you would remove the tree. I'm saying that you're impacting the tree. So we know that these older oaks don't like to have a lot of water. So if you put a lot of water right next to them, they're going to fall over. 
So are you taking that into consideration? Yes. Yes. We work, we yep, work with ahead. our county arborist um, during our design to make sure that whatever we're presenting makes sense for, for the trees and um, things like that. Right. Christoph is correct. Um, I just want to bring up an example. We just did that on Encina Avenue reconstruction and our arborist told us exactly what you just said, that oak trees do not like water. And they specifically pointed out that we should not install these underground structures next to oak trees. So yes, we will definitely look into that and take that into consideration. Thank you. Um, and then my other question was um, with the um, the three foot option and 20 feet, that ends up being 26 feet of disturbance um, to the drainage patterns of the roadway that currently we are all used to. And then you're saying six more inches or eight more inches on either side to put your forms in. So we are really kind of talking about 27 feet of roadway or, or current um, uh, disturbance to our um, roadway when we're talking about so we could potentially impact everything. And many of our trees drip lines are, even though the tree lives in our, uh, on our property, our drip lines reach out over the middle of the street. And our arborists have told us that the impact to the root structure along the drip line um, of the tree really does impact the health of the oak trees. And so again, I would ask the county to consider um, if there's a drip line that goes over the roadway. I know you can't, it's not perfect in the perfect world. You know, we do have to live in this world, but my concern is that my oak tree that lives close to the roadway is going to be impacted by if uh, if the neighborhood decides to have a 26 roadway disturbance. Um, so uh, I'm just wondering whether or not you are considering anything outside uh, the drip lines of the roadways, if you've looked at that, of the, I'm, I'm sorry, the trees that have drip lines in over the roadway. From my recollection, we 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 don't really consider that during design. I mean, again, we work with our county arborist and base our design and um, off of his recommendations to make sure that we mitigate any potential impacts to the existing trees. For the most part, we've been successful in doing several projects in the North Fair Oaks areas that have trees. And um, after our projects, they're, you know, we're there hasn't been any impacts to the trees dying or anything like that. So, um, but no, I mean, we don't take a look at private trees off of the roadway and try to understand their drip line in relation to our project. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I've got a question from Mary. Mary, I'm asking you to unmute your microphone. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So uh, we actually sent in a, a, a Q&A as well. Uh, our question is, for those of us who live on a corner lot, uh, will those individuals have input into both streets that border their property? Hmm. So for this first survey, only one vote for property. When we, if we do adopt options, um, in the future, when we survey each street, the corner lots will get one vote um, on both sides of the street because it's by frontage. So since your corner lot has frontage on two streets, uh, let's say we are reconstructing reconstructing mm -hmm. 
street A, you will get to vote on street A. And then when we're reconstructing street uh, B street, you will also get a vote on B street because your property fronts both, both, both streets. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Monsi. All right, I've got a question um, from a, it's a Samsung asking you to unmute your microphone right now. Sorry, this is Scott, Hi, Scott. on Menlo Oaks. Um, yeah, a couple comments and then a question. So first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. It is incredibly detailed and clear and helpful. And um, just a comment that I used to live on West Selby Lane and Valley gutters were put in and they were a huge benefit cleaned up the the side of the road and made everybody's properties better. Um, I just wanted to ask about the interface to existing driveways, if you could clarify like how you do that process and how you make sure that we don't end up with standing water or puddles outside of the, the valley gutters. Otherwise, I'm already moved on to thinking about how great this is going to be. <clears throat> Yeah, so we do have a five foot conform that we include as part of our projects, which means we will work five feet back from any edge of pavement. That's the area where we will work to grade driveways to make sure that they um, drain to the valley gutter. Past that five foot would be a property owner responsibility. And so there is a potential, you know, depending on the condition of the driveway and what it looks like um there's a potential that past that five foot there is a there's there can be ponding but that would be a property owner responsibility to fix but at a minimum we'll, we'll include that five feet to make sure that it drains nicely into our um, gutter right so we'll try as much as possible if the property existing elevation is lower than the road um, you know, obviously we cannot arbitrarily lower the road like by a lot in order to f have drainage flow to the road. Um, so there are instances where, you know, if the property is low to begin with, it will continue to have bonding. Uh, but we will try as much as possible to to have drainage flow to the to the new roadway when we reconstruct. Yeah, and we look okay. at it overall, and so we do, when we go through our detailed design, we do generally try to lower the roadway elevation from what's there currently. So then that provides an opportunity to collect more of the water from the shoulders and adjacent areas. Uh, but that is on a, you know, obviously case-by-case -case basis. We need to make sure that it ultimately will match up to the either end, which, you know, let's, let's take Berkeley. We'll need to make sure it matches to the bay intersection, but we try to to lower it to be able to help with those types of issues. Got it. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I've got a question from Brent. Brent, I'm asking you to unmute your microphone. How's this? Can you hear me, Nate? Yep. Great. Uh, so thanks, Christoph and Wincy, all you guys for putting in the effort. I know that this has been a long process, so um, I appreciate the detailed um, perspective here. And uh, and I also appreciate that you guys are opening up the um, presentation for Q&A from the community. Will you guys have a follow-up after this presentation where you're able to address some of the, the Q&A that's been put in both through the comment section and then also, some of the comments that are being made by uh, by the various neighbors that are asking questions. I'm I'm curious if you're going to have a follow up around that. So our plan was to have a follow up at the second community meeting, which would be the one in January after the survey is submitted. That's where we would try to provide um, responses to common questions. I mean, one thing I'm thinking about now that. Um, we're uh, hearing some of the concerns and issues is, and um, this is me talking out loud, so my team may <laughs> not like it, but uh, we may have a possibility of allowing people to change their vote after the second community meeting before we move to adopt the standards after we come back and address, you know, um, 
your issues. I think that's one option that we can look into. Whereas if you feel like the second meeting and our follow-up information changes what you're thinking, we would allow you to then change your vote before right. we move to adopt. I, I appreciate that. That's great. Um, I just know that there's a lot of comments that have been made also by some of our neighbors um, that actually aren't quite factual. So, and I know that you haven't stopped them during the process and you've allowed them to continue to talk, but I'm hopeful that, you know, there's going to be a process where you're going to be able to, you know, remediate some of these concerns and then also, you know, clarify and provide more factual information to the neighbors so that they have good information that they can vote on. So um, on the slide that you guys put up, I know that we had talked previously about the mitigation measures around trees and the impact in the community. Um, you had used the maximum width of the possibilities. So I believe that was option number six on the 20 foot wide street. And then you outlined by, by road, the number of trees that would potentially be impacted. And in, in doing so, you said that that was the maximum amount that would be impacted and that you guys would make every effort so that even though you said on certain streets there were two or three, there was a possibility that those trees might not actually need to be removed. But if you ended up um, in the neighborhood voted, say, for option number one um, for a 16 foot wide road, I didn't see like any slides subsequent to the 20 foot slide that you had in there on the trees that would be potentially impacted. Am I to assume, and I'd love for you to answer that, but I'm, I'm assuming that if it's a smaller width of road, that the impact on those particular streets and those trees would be um, lower as well. Correct. Um, I would say it's safe to assume that the roads that have one to two trees, we could, with high confidence, design our project so that we would have no impact to those trees. In all likelihood, um, even the ones with like four or five impacts, we can work to modify the design around those trees to limit impacts and, and not remove any of the trees. Uh, as you go lower or smaller in width, the amount of impacts would go down as well. The majority of the conflicts right now are right at the edge of pavement and and typically off the pavement right because the tree's not growing next to existing pavement and if the existing pavement is 18 feet then even you know if you choose option one or two which is the smallest footprint i would imagine that those impacts would get significantly less and what we can do is we can take a, a deeper dive and, and actually modify that so that we have an updated chart for all um all of the options in terms of tree impacts so that so that you guys have that information and specifically for Menlo Oaks with the 14 trees. Yeah, no, that, that would be great. And I know that a lot of neighbors are, um, are worried about speeding regardless of whether or not we have any road standards that change. Speeding has been an issue in the neighborhood. I, I just, and I know that you can't comment on this directly because this is a different department, but, um, I wanted the neighborhood to know that I've already filed, um, the appropriate paperwork for speed mitigation measures and, and additional speed reduction measures to be um, reviewed and potentially integrated into our neighborhood. Um, and I filed it both for Arlington, Menlo Oaks, and uh, Berkeley. So those should already be um, with Diana Shu. I, I know that it wasn't mentioned, but I think the neighborhood just needs to know that that's already happening concurrent with this road standards process. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Diana is with Public Works, but with our traffic group. So yeah, we're unaware of what she gets. But yeah, that's sounds like that's process will go on in parallel. So so this is Ann Stillman with Public Works. And I, I mean, Brent, to your point about, I mean, I'm, we, we are monitoring all of the questions that are coming in through the chat. And so what I heard you say was, are you going to by chance list the questions and provide responses. And I don't know that we've talked about that amongst a team, but I hear what you're saying because we may not have um, addressed all of those questions verbally. So I think that's something we should look at for sure. And I guess just another thing is that when people are trying to think about impacts and what about this and what about that, I think Christoph has explained that generally <clears throat> we're looking at 
the existing road alignment and sort of and where it is. And so people can go out and take a look. Well, how wide is the road here in an area I'm concerned? And what might it look like if it were wider, right? So that people have kind of the, the tools and the ability to really go out and take a look at what would this mean to me or what would it mean to my road? Um, and I, I feel like people should do that if they're, if they're really interested in seeing that and kind of laying it out. No, that's a great point, Anne. I appreciate that. And I know with the visuals that you guys provided to the neighborhood, you, you tried to demonstrate that visually so that people could see that. And in, in many ways, you guys have adopted the existing road widths in most of our roads to be, you know, quite similar. If we lean into say option number one, there will be very little, if any impact. And in fact, some roads would become, you know, the width would make, would become smaller. So I appreciate that you guys have taken that into uh, account. Right. And I think as Christoph was talking and as shown in the slides, he said, you know, for this particular road, kind of the average width is this, but we know that the road really varies in width. And I think that people definitely want to understand and relate what would these options mean to me, especially <clears throat> not only sort of looking at your road and your block on the road, but also specifically at my property, what would it, what would it mean and what would it look like? Because some people could be at a segment of road that's particularly narrow. So what would it mean? Or, you know, the opposite of that, something that's wider and a standard would be narrower. So and I just, I, I just think the way it's laid out and the fact that this will be on our website, it helps, you know, it just gives people the tools to be able to go out and kind of really look at it themselves and and make it relatable to to really where they are and on their on their at their property in the segment of road. Uh, absolutely, and thank you so much. And I and I know that uh, I mean our neighborhood loves um, our trees, and and they they are they're very very special. It's what makes Menlo Oaks Menlo Oaks. Um, but we we've also there's been a, a a couple of trees that have been called out, and I don't have to call them out specifically here, but you know there are some trees that are in fairly poor condition. Um, has the county looked at, you know, even though they may not potentially be impacted, um, but they are in the right of way, uh, potentially taking out some of those trees for the purposes of, uh, you know, the issues that we had on the last storm with the number of trees that we lost in the neighborhood. Um, you know, it, it is an issue with some of these trees that are in very poor condition. So would the county um, remove those as part of this process proactively if they are in very poor condition, but they're located in the right of way, even though, you know, trees in the right of way are considered to be the responsibility of the neighbor. I think we would look at the trees that would be potentially impacted by the project, but not necessarily every single tree along the roadway. Um, as part of this process and um, to be transparent, I mean, even if this process is adopted, right? I mean, then we have to run into the, we, we still have discussions about prioritizations and how this gets programmed into our overall workload. So the earliest the project would move over, move forward would probably be two to three years from now. So I guess to, to say we would not be removing any trees in the, foreseeable future within the public right of way as part of this effort. Um, well, thank you guys very much. That's all the questions I had. Okay, I've got a question from Michael Johnson. I am asking you to unmute your microphone. Yep, I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. I wanted to make a comment. You you guys have done a great job here and very very well presented. I appreciate that. The one the one thing that I did want to mention is it looks like when you're going to be sending out this uh, questionnaire, uh, people who want nothing, it's going to be either or. They get one choice and they're going to say no. I I want I want nothing to do. Just maintain it the way it is. And then they're out of the process, whereas everybody else, let's say it goes 50 plus one or 52 percent want something else. The people who wanted nothing are kind of cut out of the process. If you could make that, um, do, do you want to do nothing or do you want something? If the, you could make that part of the rank uh, 
ranked choice voting, that would be great because then those people won't be feel feel like they're cut out of the process after just one question, just after one thing. That's my comment. I want to keep it short because about time to wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And I think um, we can definitely look into that. I was thinking about that too. Well, during the presentation, I think there is a potential that in our follow-up meeting, when we come back and report out on the survey results, um, and let's say a road chose to move forward with standards, I think there is an opportunity for those people that voted no to then have an ability to pick from one of the six available options. So they do have a, a voice in what the ultimate standard looks like now that the majority of the residents on the road want an improvement. So great. Thank you. All right. I've got a question or a raised hand from Amy. Amy, um, you're, you've been asked to unmute your microphone. Amy? Okay, so you're unmuted right now, it looks like. We can't hear you, though, if you're trying to talk. Looks like you're... It, it, there's an icon and it looks like you're unmuted, but we're not able to see your microphone's not working. I can, um, if, if you wanna submit in the question and answer, if you wanna submit a written question in there, there's a lot of questions in there and we'll go over those later. Or I will, um, if you wanna re-raise re, re your hand and then you could do that as well. Okay, I've got a question from Mary. Mary, uh, have you um, unmuted your microphone? Yes, I, I had another question um, or rather uh, something to say, and that is that uh, I on the topic of speed mitigation, um, people should understand that, um, well, a few years ago, we were part of a request, we submitted a request for speed mitigation, and a study was done in which strips were put out to measure the speed at which cars passed. And the criterion was that a certain percentage of cars, I think it was 70%, seven zero, had to go a certain amount past the speed limit in order to qualify for uh, putting in speed bumps. And the problem really is the episodic speeding, incredibly dangerous speeding that occurs. And by those criteria, speed bumps would never be achieved. And I just think it's, and widening the roads is going to encourage exactly that kind of behavior, especially from high school students. So I think it it doesn't make sense to be voting on the, the road proposal when it's divorced from the decision about speed mitigation. That really needs to be addressed and we need to get some kind of assurance uh, that this will be something that will be offered to us and not by on the basis of criteria that don't make sense. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. All right, I've got a raised hand from Brent. Um, Brent, I've asked you to unmute your microphone. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, I just had one quick follow up. So actually, it's two. I wanted you to to quickly comment on the work that was done at Peninsula and Berkeley on that corner. You guys did some some drainage work and put in the type of of green mitigation efforts that you've been talking about here. So if you could do us a favor and just talk about that project for a minute, I would greatly appreciate it. And whether you think it's been a success or a failure. And then lastly, if you can please provide some clarification on like whose vote counts. I think in the very beginning of the presentation, Christoph, you said something about there were some neighbors on a specific cul-de-sac in the neighborhood that wouldn't necessarily get a vote in the process. And I'm curious about that, um, especially as that as they live off of a main roadway. I believe they live right off of Menlo Oak, so they use that every day. And uh, can you comment on that 
as it relates specifically to say neighbors that live on Ringwood or Bay Road who are also in our neighborhood, but they might not necessarily even use Arlington or Menlo Oaks or Berkeley ever. Sure. So the first was the drainage improvements. So that was done through our roads department where they installed a combination of a quasi bioretention area with some dry wells at an area that I think historically has ponded. And I believe that it was at the intersection of Berkeley and Peninsula. Peninsula. Thank you. Um, and so that is a type of uh, feature that we've installed. They were able to leverage the existing shoulder they basically dug it out, put in some pipes that went even deeper, wrapped those, filled it back up with drain rock. Um, my understanding is that that process was a good overall project and has reduced the ponding in that area and is working well. Um, and so that's definitely one, something that would be similar to what we would do through our green infrastructure installations. It would just be more formalized and would be brought to those type of locations through the valley gutters. Your second question is typically we, the way the voting works is you have to have frontage on the road that you're voting on. So the first overall vote is um, if you live in the neighborhood, you will get a vote and that vote, right, is, is um, yes or no. And then we will look on a road by road basis if you have frontage on that road for the options that we are presenting and the yes or no vote. Like I said, so there may be instances where certain roads choose to maintain as is, whereas others choose to select an option. And those votes are gonna be based on the people that live on that street. So the the, the homes that you called out in the very beginning of the, the presentation mm -hmm. in that cul-de-sac? So, so even yeah, so I think the two corner homes, um, they would get a vote, but those would be the only ones on that cul-de-sac that get a vote. But we can, um, that's historically how we've done it. Right. But, but we can look into it again. I mean, I understand what the, yeah. we understand what the um, concern is. They do use, basically could come off the court and they do use those roads. So we can, we can look into that again and see. Right. I was just trying to draw this distinction between alienating those specific neighbors who actually use Menlo Oaks every day versus neighbors that you would give a vote on, say, Ringwood or Bay that may not even use the roads in the neighborhood ever. So the property owners fronting Bay will not get a vote. And then Ringwood and Coleman property owners do not get a vote either because they are... Um, they're part of the other study and they they are not really using these inner roads in within Mellow Oaks area. So when you guys look at all of the parcels in the entire um, Menlo Oaks neighborhood, you are going to exclude Ringwood parcels and Bay Road parcels and Coleman parcels from the actual survey that you're sending out right now? Correct. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. So there's a question from Amy. Amy? Hi. Can you yes. hear me now? <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just wanted some clarification on how the green mitigation would impact the wells in the neighborhood. We do have a well on our property, and I know there are a bunch of other uh, people in Menlo Oaks who also have wells, and I was just curious if you could tell me more about that, or sure. if that will be offered in the follow-up documentation. Yeah, so I mean, there's certain item there's certain restrictions to our green infrastructure installation when there's wells in the area there's a certain setback that we need to have and depth and so we review those regulations and make sure that we don't um, necessarily impact the wells in the area and there's guidance out there for for installing green infrastructure where there are wells within the community great thank you
Okay, we've got a raised hand from John. John, you can unmute your microphone. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this is John Horsley. All right. The questions I had have just been recently answered somewhat to my dismay. Um, and I guess I'm I'm curious about by whom and on what basis the streets of Coleman and Ringwood Avenues were excluded from this process. And secondarily, what maybe even well, I'll I'll start with that question, then I have another one. Yeah, so Coleman and Ringwood, there is a separate process that's moving forward on both those streets where our Office of Sustainability is taking a much more comprehensive look at both of those roads, both in terms of multimodal approaches and um, as well as, um, you know, what the community desires. I understand there's been multiple community meetings, and so... We removed Coleman and Ringwood from that process so that they can continue and move forward with whatever the community is looking to install there. And ultimately, whatever the community decides there, we will fold into our roadway standards for the overall area. So what vote then do the residents of Coleman and Ringwood Avenues have regarding the road standard on the streets where they have frontage? So they would not have a vote in this process. You would have to provide your input on the Coleman and Ringwood study process, which I believe there's several alternatives for you guys to pick from. Yeah, no, no, we're so we're aware of that. I'm it seems like we have been divested of what rights we had under this Menlo Oaks standard through some supervening process. Well, we believe that the ultimate outcome from the Coleman and Ringwood Avenue study will ultimately lead to a roadway standard for that area. Right. And I'm wondering why we don't have the right of self-determination over that, that the other denizens of this hamlet have. Yeah, it was, it was just an... Uh, a decision to not complicate the, the two efforts. Um, again, we believe that the outcome from that Coleman Ringwood study would ultimately have the same outcome as if you were, as if we went through this process. Well, it, <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see about that. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's a raised hand from Sal. Sal, you can unmute your microphone. Hi, yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, I um, follow up in just in kind of what John is saying in terms of the uh, process on uh, which the basis of the voting is being done. Um, so I'll have two questions on this. Uh, so one is, as a neighborhood, um, you know, we all live in the neighborhood. The neighborhood has a certain you know reasons why we live here. We use the roads, we use it for walking, we use it for driving, we use it for different reasons. And to say that, you know, Coleman residents or Ringwood residents or Bay residents do not use any of these streets for any other purpose, this doesn't seem right, right? So that's one thing I would say, I don't know how that determination is being made that as a community, we have, you know, a network of streets that we use for different things. And it's a system that basically we all have to understand that we, we live within the system. And that includes the school, that includes people coming in from the city, that includes people coming off Willow, et cetera. So to basically kind of take this divide and conquer approach where you're basically including some people, not including some people on the basis of why we choose to live in the neighborhood. Um, firstly, it doesn't feel appropriate, right? Or I do think it will actually not even lead to the right outcome. So that's one kind of, you know, second thing is, again, I would just want to understand the basis because, you know, again, from the perspective of the, how the voting is done, traditionally, any changes to the road standards, voting wise have been with what was adopted in the county bylaws was a, you know, a, a majority of the homeowners, right? It didn't say it by street A, by street B. 
So again, going following up kind of what John said, like how is the determination, like what is the basis for you know deciding like who's voting and who's not voting? Like why are we breaking from previous standards that were established and have been used for every change we've made in the neighborhood? So we feel like the people on the in the neighborhood um, get to vote in the process, whether it's through this process or the Ringwood Coleman study. Again, we decided to remove Coleman and Ringwood from this process to not confuse the two efforts, and because that process is more complicated and includes more so, items. So I, so I understand that part. So that part can make somewhat. I mean, I, I agree with John. I just feel like. The people on those streets then either have vote there nor have vote here. So that's extremely frustrating. But I think what I'm saying is even if you basically go with that, even for the changes in the road standard for Menlo Oaks, we are residents of Menlo Oaks. We use those streets. We walk, you know, we drive, we, you know, we participate in the neighborhood as with everybody else. So I think that is part of the question is like, you know, for example, you're saying that people in Madison right now will have a vote on whether Menlo Oaks drive should get say yes or no right no we're going to break it down on a road i mean we'll oh, see wait, what... so i thought the 51 percent was basically based on the entire neighborhood no no so we'll we will take it on a road by road basis so we will get granular in that got it okay so i maybe i was confused so you're saying that the, even the initial vote when you say yes or no that is still by street so, for example, if 51% of Menlo Oaks Drive says yes, and 51% of Berkeley says no, then Menlo Oaks Drive will proceed with the changes, but Berkeley will not? Correct. Got it. Okay. So, there is no yes or no in terms of changing the root standards at the community level? Correct. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think we should make that clear because I think that is, there. I mean, I did not fully understand that basically every vote here will be done only specific to that street. No, yeah. So there's a there's a potential that when we're done with the process, a handful of roads will choose to maintain as is. So we will do that. And then a handful will choose to adopt standards. And then based on what their preference is, those standards may vary as well. So, I mean, one question, I mean, is that, again, just going back to the whole neighborhood stuff, right? Again, from the perspective of neighborhood as a community, I would do wonder if the community would be okay with our streets being a complete mishmash of streets. Um, you know, so again, you know, kind of like again, part of, part of goes back to I think how the decision was made on voting, but that would be something that I think a number of neighbors would have in the consideration, which is would we have you know different roads be adopting different standards and kind of lose what the neighborhood basically you know kind of feels like yeah i mean that's the the decision we made and i mean i think it goes both ways right if it if you do it the other way i think people would have similar concerns of why does menlo oaks get to decide what i on colby get to vote for right and so we're yeah, trying to okay, make it yeah, grand. Yeah. It's, fine. it's fine i'll send my comments you know separately i think you know the question is that has been the previous kind of approach we have taken and adopt it as a neighborhood. So, you know, one question is why why are we deciding to change that? Yeah, I think we want to get more granular with the results so that people on roads that want improvements have that ability um, to make Got those it. improvements. Okay, you know, I, I think that makes sense. I, I that part wasn't super clear to me initially. I thought I I I thought it was still going to be a a a kind of a neighborhood wide wood and then a secondary uh, street by street. Um, kind of breakdown. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ramon, I've got your, I've been asked to unmute your microphone. Okay, didn't I unmute? Yeah. Okay, so um, I just wanted to get clarification on the voting. Um, so if you don't, so at the end of our we live on a flag lot on Berkeley and there's three houses down here, but our property is the only one is, is the, um, has the easement onto Berkeley. Do the other two not get a vote? 
since they their property doesn't have a frontage on the actual road? Is that what I'm hearing? So if they if they still do have like a flat, uh, what does it call it? The access from um, from the easement. front of the street. Yes, easement from the front of the street to the back. They will still be able to vote according to the frontage um, proportion to the entire length of the road. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other raised hands uh, with verbal questions? Oh, that doesn't look like it. If there are, then you can um, continue to raise. I'm going to go through some questions here. I've got about 26 questions. Um, I'm going to try to I think some of these have been answered, but I just want to go through them quickly. Um, so I've got a question from Dennis. Um, can we adopt different options on different roads? And so we've already discussed that. Um, we Currently, we're looking at um, doing different options on different roads. Um, I've got a question from Deborah. Um, would the drainage remain the existing dry wells? So my understanding is the the drainage, there wouldn't be any drainage improvements except for the green infrastructure potentially. Is that correct? Correct. And if she's talking about the the ones we did on Berkeley and, and Peninsula, that would remain. Okay. Okay, so I've got a question from Dennis. Uh, how, how would these options be coordinated with West Bay Sanitary District and Cal Water? Um, and they've got they, they potentially have programs to update their uh, utilities. So would that be coordinated? Like, for example, if you were going to uh, yeah. um, replace a road, you coordinate with them? Okay. Yeah. So prior to the start of any project, we send out letters, notification letters, notice of intent letters to all the utilities in the area, letting them know that we're doing a project. I think what we're going to do is if these projects get, um, if we end up adopting road standards, we'll then develop a priority list. We'll make sure to send that priority list with anticipated construction dates to all the utilities so that they can proactively plan their infrastructure upgrades. We do have a two-year moratorium once we're done with roads, meaning you can't dig up the road two years after we're done with it. Um, and I think there was one question from Ted, um, Nate, that you skipped over, but it's the same. The, Will there be one selected option apply for the entire neighborhood? Um, it will be on a per street basis. Okay, I've got, a, I've got an anonymous question um, asking if you are able to vote for a street that's not your own street. And so we've clarified that, that the vote is for the um, street that you live on. Correct. How will street parking, question from Dennis, how will street parking be imp impacted by any of these options? So there will be impacts. Um, generally, our analysis of the area is that there's plenty of right of way and plenty of shoulder area for people to park. Um, but with any widening of the roadway, we will be taking that shoulder area. So there's a potential that certain areas, certain shoulder areas where people park will be smaller than they are now and potentially could be eliminated. I've got a question from Sarah. Where can I see a picture of the road in front of my home? Um, I so, don't know that we're looking at each house at this moment. Yeah, but. no, we, we try to do a representative rendering, so we won't have renderings for specific homes. Um, but again, you could take a look at our standards and then do some measurements in front of your home to get kind of a better understanding. Basically, what we would do is we would keep generally the center line of the roadway in front of your home. So if you measure the width of the road, and then you can kind of do the, you know, extend it either way based on the options that we're presenting. Okay, I've got um, an anonymous question here, and there were a few like this, and it was, it, there was concern about if, if someone doesn't respond to the survey, uh, we're counting the vote as saying, um, don't, don't update the options at all. So they, they didn't actually vote, but it's almost like they're voting. Yeah, that's just the the way we count these votes. I mean, we we don't want to go through a process of installing improvements. Um, basically, you have to have an affirmative vote to to want improvements, right? People want to have to choose to do it, and so we consider a non response as a no vote um, because they're choosing either not to participate or don't want an option. Again, this is where we need your help to get the vote out as much as possible. 
we've sent out multiple letters and mailings and, and have this meeting. We'll follow up with more proactive information. We'll post on next door, things like that. But whatever you guys can do to help us get the vote out would be great. Um, I've got a question from Dennis. Um, if uh, if if the roads are draining towards Bay Road, um, there's there's just wonder if there's any plans of um, changing the drainage once it gets to Bay Road. Yeah, and to clarify, the it, the goal is not to convey all of the water to Bay. It will be captured along the way, so the amount of water draining to Bay will will be minimal or in similar nature to to what we have now. I mean, it'll be a little bit more, um, but we. You know, the, definitely the plan is not to inundate Bay with a big slug of water. Um, and in all likelihood, what we will do is try to cite a GI feature right before anything hits Bay so that we capture it. Okay. Um, an anonymous question. Um, does Peninsula School get to take the survey? Yes, I yes. believe. Yep, that's correct. Yes. Okay, I've got questions from Karen. Um, the first one, I think we already talked about it, was if um, Ringwood and Coleman would get to vote. Um, so we've already dis discussed that. Um, this is the second question. Um, by updating the road standards through this process, would the county be able to change the road standards without residents input and agreement in the future? No. I mean, we typically, we will take this to the board of supervisors to be adopted for the road standards for the area. That's what we've done historically with road standards. And then once they're adopted, you cannot modify them without going back to the board. And generally we wouldn't do that without another um, process of community input. Um, I will say that it is a costly effort to go through this type of um, community outreach and updating the standards and um, the main reason we were able to go through this process is through funding that was secured by Supervisor Horsley and Supervisor Slocum. And so it's not like we would do this on a regular interval um, in the future. Okay, I've got, a, I've got another um, anonymous question. It's about just offering an opinion if you think that um, keeping the uh, the result is just leave as is and do the maintenance. Is that is that better or is there a benefit, do you think, to doing to updating the road standards? Um, I don't think we have an opinion either way. It's really what the community wants. Um, it is really up to the community. Um, we will do whatever you guys want. We will go out there and maintain as is and, and pothole and, and patch and, and slurry or come in and give you a complete new roadway. Right, I guess I would just add that, I mean, that's that when we talk about road standards, we understand that Menlo Oaks is unique. And so here we are with, there are a lot of questions about some of the things that are sort of near and dear to people's hearts, right? And so, you know, there was a process that the county went through in the past, and it was maintained as is, probably for some of the reasons that we're talking about it today. So um, I guess I just sort of think about the history of things and, and knowing that um, there are a lot of things that we have to work around, right? There are a lot of questions about how, how about this and how about that. There's a lot of details when you get into any road reconstruct projects. And so I think you, um, those that have been in attendance of this meeting are certainly airing many of those things that they're thinking about and concerned with. And those are all part of what goes into basically once you get to the design of a project. Okay, I've got another anonymous question. Um, this one I'm not, I don't completely understand. Um, Will more maintenance be done on a more regular basis? And will all the roads get surface treatment? I'm not sure if I if I can recall that one. It was in response to, to another person's comment. If that that if you haven't gotten your question answered, it was submitted a while ago. Um, if you could just raise your hand, we can talk at the end here. Um, I think it's asking about the maintain as is option. And I would say we provide maintenance as, as needed. Um, and so it would just go into our regular cycle of maintenance work, which again is on a 13 year cycle. So the maintain as is roads would get treated once every 13 years, roughly. 
and then some periodic maintenance in between that would be limited to like potholes and, and things like that with no major um, work outside of that 13 year cycle. Right, but I think also, Christoph, you know, as you were defining maintain as is the current standard, you know, I mean, just talking about what maintain as is and what it could involve, you showed the pictures, you talked about it. I, f I feel like when we went through this process in the past, maintain as is, is, a, is defined potentially a little bit different than what we've been talking about today, right? So I, I guess for me, when I, th when, when I think about, you know, um, we're not, we ha maintain as is, has been sort of interpreted of, we're not going to do sill projects in the past, you know, we're going to maintain, we're going to deal with potholes. And I think when we're talking about maintain as is now, we're saying, well, you know, including treatments, surface treatments, like Christoph went over and similar potentially to things like what was done on Berkeley or some of the other roads um, that Christoph mentioned that we worked on this last summer. That's what that's what it says to me. But thank you for that. Okay, I've got another um, question here. So, if uh, road standards are not adopted, will the county still try to address the encroachment violations into the right of way? There's a concern that there's um, with with parking and there's there's a concern about safety of having things um in encroaching into into the right of way um so generally no i mean we do not go and look for encroachment violations outside of a project and even with our project we try to limit any kind of um, removal of encroachments unless it's needed for the construction of the project so unless it's a very rampant violation um i don't think we would be looking to um you know go on a property by property basis to understand what encroachments were permitted versus not right but i think that's not to say that if there are issues with site you know sort of visibility those sorts of issues then um you know people could be given notices for trimming vegetation and whatnot i mean obviously we need to make sure that um there's sufficient ro uh, width on the roadway and there are no safety issues related to visibility. Okay. Question from Deborah: um, Is a three-foot wide valley gutter uh, more flat compared to a two-foot wide valley gutter? Um, wondering if maybe the three-foot wide would allow a place to walk along this along the street. Um, Wednesday, John, maybe you can chime in. I mean, uh, my understanding is no. We keep the depth of the uh, valley gutter the same it's just wider so then it allows for more storage of water as it conveys right correct be slightly flatter but it's not that much different um there there are uh three foot we'll sit when the letter will send you examples of where two foot and three foot valley gutters have been and you can go out there and see if you can walk on them Okay. Got an anonymous question here. Um, if there's a pinch point in the roadway because of a tree, uh, would is there a potential to remove the tree or would the road have to go around the tree? There's a question about a tree on um, Berkeley um, in, in particular. Uh, we would review it on a case-by-case -case basis to understand really what the impact is to the travel way. Generally, we try to keep trees and move the roadway around it and then maintain you know, the, the minimum and as close to the minimum standard as we can. But overall, unless um, it's preventing people passing through, um, we, would not, we would try to keep the tree. Okay, um, got another question, um, Ramona. Uh, we, it's, I, th I think it's talking about a f the five foot. Um... On form. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the just to explain what, it in a little bit more detail. Yeah. So what we mean by five foot conform is we, when we go in and do a construction project, um, we have the six to twelve inches of of space that we need to use for formwork and building the valley gutter. And so imagine we put in a valley gutter in front of your existing driveway that connects to a road. What we would do is from the edge of that valley gutter, we would go back as far as five feet and then replace whatever that material is. 
um, with asphalt concrete. Um, so we don't match the existing. So if you have like pavers, things like that, we do not match or replace those. But what we try to do is make that area um, meet the help with drainage, meet the valley gutter edge, um, and make sure that it's smooth so that you have no issues getting in and out of your driveway. And we limit that to five feet. Um, and then the rest of it would be property owner responsibility. Okay. I've got another question here. Um, there was there was a request submitted for speed mitigation um, a few years ago. Um, the decision to do the mitigation or not was based on percent of drivers exceeding the limit. Um, and there's been there's there's concern now because there's a lot more speeding. And has anything changed in the criteria for um, speed mitigation and choosing whether or not to do it or not? Um, I would defer to our traffic group. I'm not sure when your submittal was put in, but we can um, forward you or I can forward that question to our traffic group and they can provide a response to you. I'm not sure if any of the criteria for the residential speed control program have changed over the last few years, but what the current requirements are, are on that website. And if you go to the answer tab on the question and answer, that's the website where you can find the information. All right. Um, question for from Deborah. Um, might there be funds for replacing trees that are impacted? No. Especially look. We would not be replacing any trees as part of this project um, through any kind of county funds. Okay. Got a question from Diana. Berkeley and Peninsula um, Green Infrastructure. Um, it was an in-ground detention system set up to minimize ponding. Yeah, Diana's um, a county yeah, staff. Yeah, I, I think she's just she's making a clarifying. comment. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that sorry. There was one, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I got another question from Ramona. Uh, these these neighbors have Menlo Oaks addresses and they use the roadway. I think that was a comment during the uh, question when we were talking about if... Um, yeah, and I think uh, we would... We'll we'll discuss it internally, but I think we are going to extend the survey to those folks as well because they are using Menlo Oaks as their main ingress and egress. Okay, um, so I've got a question from Tom um, to clarify: uh, Berkeley and Menlo Oaks are long roads. Is it possible that one block of um, of Berkeley could vote yes, and another block could convert convert no? So you've got different sections of roads of a single road having the different standards on it. Yes, we, because, right, I think so. It's just it's by block by block, so. Yeah, ultimately if um, road standards are adopted, the, our current process when we go out on a street specific community is we do it on a block by block process. And you then at that point have a second chance to vote whether you want improvements or not and um, which of the improvements you want to um, pick. So yes, ultimately it will be on a block by block basis. Okay, I've got another question from uh, Ramona. Um, some of the parcels that are, uh, or some of the parcels that are corner um, between two roads, they've got circular driveways. Um, I think it might be questioning which would they be able to vote for two streets if they were on the corner. Yeah, so we answered that question. If they are a corner lot, they would have two votes because it's by frontage to the street. Okay. Um, got, got another question here from Ramona. Some of the wells are not registered with the county. How will you be able to locate and mitigate for the green structure? Um, so we base it off of available records. Um, you know, through the design process, we send out letters informing people that we're going through the design. And so that would be your opportunity to provide us that information if you have it or you think we don't have it. But generally, I think the um, the restriction is more about depth of our GI as opposed to um, like lateral clearances. So um, again, it, that's something that 
people would need to reach out to us to to let us know if if we if they feel like we don't have that information. Okay. Um, another question from Ramona. It's about um, the community Ringwood and Coleman study. Um, is that is that just Moda or the broader San Mateo County community? Um, so on that, I think they're trying to ask what that who's involved in that study, the study, the community community the community Ringwood and Coleman study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would defer to our office of. Um sustainability i'm not closely involved with that study um so we can we can find out and, and get back to with that response or that answer okay i've got another question from ramona it's about um consider breaking up the 100 to 400 block and 500 and 900 block um as ecosystems and use these res uh, usage of these roads are different due to throughput I'm not sure i understand that I, I, I can see Ramona has their hand raised I'm going to allow Ramona to talk here hi thanks hi. I'm typing fast what I mean is the throughput of the of the vehicles so we have a lot of uh, on the 400 100 to 400 block we have a lot of school traffic and on the 500 to 900 block we don't get as many cars going through there so what i meant was throughput of traffic on that and the second thing the the next question i'll just read it out that i had was i wanted to give a shout out to the county's fix it app or link i i would love it if um and stillman could provide that or someone uh of the staff could provide that in this link so that people can proactively if they have a pothole i I used the link the other day and in two days that pothole was fixed. So people can take an active participation in, um, you know, letting the county know rather than waiting for them to discover the pothole. Right. So you, you reported it through Mainstar, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. okay. exactly. There's a link. There's right, right. a link. And I, just, uh -huh. and I think you guys should, you know, promote that more. I don't. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for your questions. So okay. back um, to written. Yeah. Uh, so, so will the votes be paper or electronic? It appear the presentation there'll be a paper ballot. Yeah, um, we but... require paper ballot because it needs to be signed. Okay. But we did, like I said, if if there's a desire to have office hours or something like that, that you guys think would be helpful um, for dropping off ballots or providing additional information, please let us know. Okay, I've got a question from Brian here. Um, you mentioned that flag, lot, flag lots get to vote for the length of their easement. Um, are you saying that the vote is weighted by foot of frontage? So a person with more frontage has a vote that outweighs someone with less frontage. Not yes, a, that's the way it's set up right now. Not, not in this, not in the survey that you're going to. Oh, receive. right, right. This, this, that this when the first we, one. when we um, go individual streets, it's based on frontage. Yeah. After so this, the road standards have been adopted. So this efforts, everybody gets an equal vote. And then as we go on a street by street specific process, that's um, you do get it's weighted based on your frontage compared to the street. All right. Uh, and I've just got a few more questions here. Anonymous a question. Can you please address the current status of the roads based on the PCI index? Are the roads OK based on this index? Um, or do roads have any base or have they completely failed? So the majority of the roads in the area do not have a base, um, which is why um, moving forward with the standards, we're including reconstruction. Most of the PCI in the area is pretty bad. Um, and I wouldn't say they're completely failed, but um, if we move forward with adopting standards, we are going to do a priority list based on drainage issues followed by PCI number. 
which is for those unaware, PCI is the payment condition index. And it's a numerical number from zero to a hundred that rates the um, condition of a roadway, a hundred being a brand new paved roadway, zero being completely failed. Um, we have the information, I don't have it at, on hand, but I think most of the roads in this area were sub 50, which we consider um, pretty bad. Okay. So, so that's the last written question I have here. Um, if I missed your question, um, but then you feel free to raise your hand. I do have one raised hand right here. So we'll let um, Jim, um, I'm asking you to unmute your microphone. Thank you for that. My question goes back to mentioning that about in the second phase after this initial survey, in terms of the amount of frontage you have gets weighted in terms of what you know, what standard is adopted? Is that correct? Yeah. So when we go through the second, um, if the standards are adopted and we go on a community on a road specific community meeting, you then will have an option to vote on the standards that are available to you. If okay. there's multiple standards and then that's weighted based on your frontage. Okay. So my concern, it's not a concern. It just goes to how Peninsula School will in terms of their frontage, because for example, on some streets, they take up more than 70% of the whole street on one side, which, you know, would give them a particularly large say in, in what happens with the streets, whether it's on Colby or on Berkeley or on Peninsula Way compared to the rest of the neighbors. And, you know, they are I mean, I love Peninsula School, but, you know, they are a business and I'm, you know, who within that school gets to make that decision and how that plays into, you know, the 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 rest of the community. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if we've had that experience before or not and how we've handled it. Um, one C, John or Andy. <laughs> I'm not really well, sure. I guess I guess I would say that um, uh, I really appreciate all of the sort of detailed information, the things that people are are bringing up. You know, it just helps us look at it more uh, strategically, fairly, all that sort of, you know, just the different angles. So um, I know where Peninsula School is. Now, of course, what are we going to do? We're going to look at the details so to your question to better understand that, because right off the bat, in the typical way we would look at it is if Peninsula School has a lot of footage, you know, they would have a pretty significant vote. But but thank you for the comment. I You know, we've recorded it. And I think that that along with talking about people that live in the neighborhood but maybe don't front the roads you know it just helps us see things from different perspectives um and helps us sort of think it through reevaluate that's kind of where i am right now in my head just thinking about some of the specific comments and concerns and the neighborhood aspect etc but i think that part of it too is you know it's trying to develop like, do people want roads to, do people want improvements if they do, what are they looking for? But then when you get down, as as people had said, to the specifics of, okay, now we're going to work on this road, people get another sort of look at it. And what do they specifically want when we're looking at their individual road? But to have a kind of a suite or a set of standards to be able to to look at and be able to move forward with and see if property owners are still in favor of a road standard. This is this gets us closer um, to being able to move in that kind of a direction. I think somebody also they have a question about voting and whether it's paper or electronic and um, what is the what is our answer on that? I think people. I think there's a some of the comments are saying probably better response rate if it was electronic. Um, I know we talked about it internally, but I don't remember the answer to that question. Yeah, so we we considered it, but then oh. because we need a signature, right? Because if you do electronic, then it's hard to uh, evaluate who submitted, and what one person could be submitting multiple votes. Okay, through so it's going to be hard copy. Yeah, exactly. So okay. it will be hard copy. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think um, I feel like we've been recording, you know, taking all the questions. And then I think there was, you know, I think I spoke to it earlier. Somebody's saying, are you going to respond to all the questions? I think we 
we'll need to put some responses. Some of them are probably getting at the same questions, but if we can kind of group them and provide responses on the project webpage, I think that would be helpful for people. Yes, we will definitely do that. Yep. yep. All right. Okay. We, yeah, I think I think we can yeah. close it to the Q and A, Nate. And if you want to, um, were you going to do this last slide? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Krista. <laughs> all right. So, with no further questions, uh, thank you all for participating tonight. Um, I think we went a little bit over, but definitely appreciate you sticking here with us, uh, providing questions. Like Anne said, I think it's really good to to get a better understanding of some of your concerns. Obviously, we try to be proactive in identifying it, but this is really helpful to our analysis. Um, if you have additional questions, you can contact John or Wensi. Their information is right there. Feel free to uh, email us. Um, again, we're going to be posting this and responses to questions on our website. You can see the QR code there with the website. You can also download a copy of the survey in advance there, and then we'll be sending it out um, tomorrow for yeah, first class Shortly. mail. So you guys should have that soon. Um, again, for survey, we are currently due December 6th. And so we'll be, again, evaluating that if, if, if there's an extension warranted there or not. But um, currently, let's plan on December 6th. And with that, that concludes tonight's meeting. Um, thank you all and have a good night. <laughs>